I go for refuge and top enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and top enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. <coughs> Just jump right into the back into the Lam Ribbon text. And uh, so obviously we're in the section on the six perfections. And we're right near the end of the section of the section on um, patience. So we already covered, you know, the aspect of patience that's um, you know, patient with harm from others. And we were we left off talking about the patience that accepts uh, suffering. Uh, some translators even say uh, embraces suffering, which I kind of like to do better. I, think. I like that translation. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of um, I'll just review that because we're on that section about uh, how to cultivate the patience that accepts or embraces suffering. Um, and so, there, Lama Tsongkhapa made a couple of points, uh, a number of points. One was. Um, so you say right. Like if you um, if you're already like, say it this way. The idea here is not to pursue suffering, obviously, right? We're not like trying to suffer, but the, this recognition that if you're within samsara, then suffering is a natural part of experience, right? And so a couple points he makes. One is um, to have the habit of then getting upset that you're suffering only makes your suffering worse, right? Like rather than just saying, of course, of course, suffering happens. Like, what do you expect? This is the nature of samsaric existence. I'm not in nirvana, so of course I suffer. Um, and that if we practice, he's, he's making this point that if you practice being tolerant of or uh, accepting of what is, which includes suffering, that gives you more mental peace. That's one point. Then he makes this other point, which is where we left off, and I'll just mention it again, where he says, then also if from the, and this comes really from the, um, well, the long rim here, but also it's taught extensively in the mind training, the Lojong teachings of Tibetan Buddhism, um, where he says, then there's a way of transforming suffering into the path. That's what he's talking about next. And he says, he makes this point, he says, um, there are so many ways in which if you, that's, this is important, like just merely suffering isn't useful. Right? I mean, just the fact of suffering, there's nothing so wonderful about that. But he's saying, if you use suffering to help you contemplate um, the Lam Rim, actually, then the suffering becomes deeply meaningful. And, it can, and actually, that suffering can help you on your spiritual path if you know how to relate to it. Um, and then he gives some examples, right? Like, so there's the low-scope meditations that we studied about um, de developing the wish to become free from samsaric existence. And he's saying, well, those are, you know, in other words, we can relate to those intellectually, but actually, when you're actually suffering, if you apply those, it gives you a more visceral experience, right? In other words, if you're really going through a hard time, there's a famous story of um, the great Kagyu master, Gampopa, right? Before he became um, Milarepa's disciple, he, he, he's like very famous for being a, the, the most foremost disciple of the great yogi Milarepa, but before that, he was a physician. He was like a well-known doctor, a Tibetan doctor. And then um, he was very much in love with his wife, and they were like having this happy, you know, sort of, he had a medical practice, and he was in, you know, in love with this wonderful woman. And she died suddenly, quite young. And he um, became overwhelmed with grief, you know. <clears throat> and then he thought about this teaching, and he thought, well, this is the nature of samsara. Like, you know, and like, like, you know, maybe I, I can imagine, I know this isn't his biography, but you can imagine people saying, oh, well, it'll, you'll be better, it's just a matter of time, then you'll find somebody else. Or something. And then he was like, well, but I'm like her, and everybody else is like her. We're all subject to impermanence and death. What am I doing? I want to become free from this, right? And then he went and became a monk and studied the mind training teachings and then studied with Mother Rapa. So the point being, sometimes facing our suffering but using it to develop renunciation is one way of then the suffering actually becomes something like our teacher. Does that make sense? 
uh, where you, you're what was before just an intellectual <coughs> exercise. Oh well, every you know, everywhere they're suffering, everybody's suffering. You know, what, then when something really hard happens to you, if you can apply it in this way, it becomes like your teacher. Um, and then he says, also suffering eliminates our own arrogance. Right? So if you have a tendency to be what's the word, somewhat prideful or arrogant or self-important, then you know, like you know, like um, let's say, let's say this right. If you're like sick and you're vomiting and you're holding on to the toilet, it's hard to feel like, oh, I'm the greatest thing in the world. You know, like, if you're, and actually, like, me, I, I'm, I don't remember what the story. I remember this story that, uh, like, there was a story that Lama Zopa Rinpoche was on an airplane, like, and he, like, there was a guy who, you know, like, was in, a, like, a three-piece suit, was very, like, kind of, this very successful sort of CEO type guy, you know, who looked, was, like, very handsome and wealthy, and, and um, I think the story was, like, Roger, I think Roger told the story. He said Lama Zobar, he was looking like really sad. Like he looked at this guy and he was just like so sad. And the guy was like, you know, sort of like, well, can't you upgrade me to first class? You know, something like that. And um, and like he was seeming very like pleased with himself or something. And Lama Zobar, he was looking sad. And Roger said to Lama Zobar, I think it was like, what's Ripshay, What what's wrong or something? And Ripshay said, oh, you could see, like that guy's inner world and his future is so sad. Like if you look at him. And you see what his inner world and then what his future is like. It's very sad, you know. Like it was the arrogance, right? And like, and if you think about it, in the world, this is really true. Like, what? Actually, this is not just a Buddhist insight. I, I mean, I noticed this in being a psychologist. I noticed this. Like, when somebody's arrogant and narcissistic, like other people telling them they're arrogant and narcissistic only leads them to become angry and belligerent at those people. Um, you know, even like when they have success, they're actually their arrogance and narcissism become more extreme, actually. And the only thing that makes them humble, which is what Lama Sankar was getting at, is loss, suffering, you know, pain, actually. That then the person goes, oh, maybe I'm not who I thought I was, the greatest person, most, the most important, most wonderful person in the world. It, that it's only, when somebody has that kind of mindset, it's mainly loss dif and difficulties that shift their mindset. And that's what Lama Sankar is, he's having this, that psychological, he's sharing that psychological insight here. Um, he says, with suffering, my conceited sense of superiority is destroyed. Right? And it's sad, actually, I'll just say that. It's sad, like, because that is, often as when we're in that mode of conceit, that's one of the, it's hard to get out of it unless you're, unless, until you suffer. Um, actually, I'll, be, I'll share a very brief person. My, uh, I mean, um, I actually saw this, that, that, the truth of that with my own dad, actually. He was, um, I loved him very much, but he had that tendency to be a little bit arrogant. Uh, he, was, he had a strong tendency to be arrogant. Um, and then he developed multiple sclerosis. And uh, it reached a point where he couldn't move, you know, he couldn't walk, and then he couldn't move, he couldn't, you know, like he couldn't do anything. Um, and I saw this happen. Like, there was, um, I mean, I, I loved him always, but, um, but as he got closer and closer to the end of his life, I really saw how he became humbler and more compassionate and more gentle in himself. And it was through the suffering of, it was like it's hard to be arrogant when you can't go to the bathroom yourself or you can't take a shower yourself. Or, you know, and as those things got taken away, I watched. I was like, oh wow, he's losing that, that tendency to be arrogant. I remember talking to him about it and he said, well, I thought that was like how I would survive. He said, but that didn't, it's not really working anymore. So forget about it. You know, he, was kind of, he was able to acknowledge it. He was like, when you're in business and you're, you know, sort of, he was sort of like saying, and it helped him to be that way, he thought, when he was like sort of trying to compete with other people. But then when he was sick, it was like, oh, it doesn't, it's, uh, it like fell apart, so to speak. Um, and then he says other benefits, right, is if you understand karma, then when you're miserable, it's like karma is your teacher telling you stop doing negative actions. Um, and especially if you study the section on karma, right, you can see how, if you contemplate when you're suffering, well, what was the karma of this, right? We tend to blame other people when we suffer. But if you study the teaching on karma and you actually analyze, well, what would be the karmic cause of this, rather than blaming other people, then you think, well, I don't want to do that kind of action again. You don't blame yourself either, right? Oh, I'm so bad. That's not the point. But if you think about karma, you say, well, I don't want to do that, then, like, this is a miserable experience. You know, like, I don't want to keep creating the cause of this. So it becomes a teacher not to do those kind of actions. Then it also becomes a teacher to do virtuous actions, right? Because you say, well, why does everybody else, like, why are other people having success and I'm not? Right? And it's, it's the idea as well, do more positive things to have success. 
Um, uh, and finally, he says, um, and then also, and this is maybe the most important one, um, it's through suffering, if, if we relate to suffering in the right way, it becomes a teacher of compassion. Right? In other words, you can empathize. When you're suffering, and then you can think, well, others, countless others suffer this way. And everybody goes through things like this. But I usually just ignore them. But now that I'm going through it, I can actually relate to their suffering. Right? And so you use your own suffering to enhance your empathy and compassion for others. You know, and then you can see how somebody, if somebody's doing all that, right, and if the main purpose of their life is to become enlightened, right, and then they start doing that, then you can see how somebody could say, wow, so like, the experience of difficulties or suffering is like a gift. It's giving me renunciation, it's giving me bodhicitta, it's giving me love and compassion. And so then instead of being averse to suffering and thinking, oh, it's all bad, such a person who practices this way, and this is what he's saying, over time, through training, could actually come to think, okay, well, you know, good things happen and bad things happen. When bad things happen, that's my teacher. That's something teaching me. How, what can I learn from this? Can I, am I going to focus on renunciation, on compassion, on uh, karma? And in that way, all of life arises as your teacher, right? Um, and then, so then you embrace all that is, right, and you, including the suffering. So that's why I like that, I like that translation, embracing. Right, you embrace it because it's, it's teaching you something. So then uh, he quotes the verse. If you get used to some, if you get, uh, basically, well, I'll just summarize. Basically what it's saying is, if you get used to this through minor harms, right? If, so in other words, if you start training this way now, and this is actually important advice. The advice here is this, is if you want to get good at this practice, start now with small problems. Because they'll come along. You'll, luckily, you'll have those to practice with sometimes. Um, and only through that will you become able to then do this with big losses and big pain. Does that make sense? Otherwise, big losses will overwhelm you. But if you start it with whatever, like, you know, tolerable things, like, what's the word? You have to, like, start it wherever you're at, but also, actually, I'll give a real example. I mean, like, a story today, but uh, Reba Rimsha used to say that, like, you know, he was amazing at this. He was actually the best person I ever met, uh, heard of, you know, at this. Um, but he, when he was being tortured, for years and years, like by the uh, communist Chinese army, he said his main suffering was seeing the other Tibetans because they hadn't trained in this. He said, like he said, actually the quote, the it was a famous quote from him at the time when he was alive, where he said, um, uh, "Although my body, although my body was suffering, in my mind there was pure joy, while being in the um, communist Chinese prison and being tortured." And then, but then he said, "But I felt bad for the other Tibetans, basically." because they hadn't trained in this. And so they didn't know how to find any meaning in it. They just were miserable and suffering horribly with no, mentally and physically. And he said, like, you know, because he, he had already trained himself. <coughs> so for him, he could find, he was practicing what we're describing. So for him, he found meaning, and therefore mental peace and mental joy. But he said, oh, the other Tibetans couldn't because they didn't practice. So the meaning of that for us is practice now. You know, because someday, you may not, uh, hopefully you won't end up in a prison, but someday you'll end up with some disease, right? Or some problem in your life, or some uh, external or internal, you know, so your body or the external environment will turn bad uh, at some point. That's just the nature of life. Sometimes that happens. So if we practice now, we'll be prepared. Does that make sense? That's what's... Is this something about. they would typically build into insight meditation? They would, like, reach a meditative state and then kind of analyze... Analyze what? Of their suffering? Yeah, so that's what he's describing when he says, like, Viewing it as the, uh, like right, I'm just trying to like how they build it into their practice. Yeah, so like an example would be like you start off, like you would start off actually on your cushion doing it, right? Like, mm. like so actually thinking, okay, you know, like because um, the way I kind of saw it is that like as a Westerner is that I would think about it, I probably write it up, and then I keep it in some sort of journal to go back to at some later point if I forgot about it. But then I was thinking that Buddhist monks probably don't do it that way. No, yeah, they don't journal much. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah, they, I mean, they would do, they start off, you would usually start off by doing it on your cushion, like contemplating these topics that he just, that Lama Sokamla just taught. And then once you've done that for a while, then you try to apply it as, as it's happening. <coughs> Does that make sense? Like more, like you actually start training yourself to go, okay, as some difficulty arises, I'll try in that moment to apply those things. But you have to start off by, because it's unfamiliar, right? That's what he's saying. You have to familiarize yourself. So he's saying, first, and, and actually I'll give an example. Like they might st say, well, start off with just like, I don't know, like if you have a, 
you know, if you get the flu, right? Like to think, okay, well, first of all, you know, countless people get the flu. Some people are dying of the flu. Let me have, you know, let me, let me actually meditate on their suffering. You know, then also this is the nature of existence. One of the, right, uh, birth, aging, sickness, and death, right, or some of the sufferings of samsara. So you would contemplate those things formally, but then there, hopefully there will come a point where it starts to become natural. Uh, your natural way of relating, and, and you're trying to become familiar until it becomes more. <coughs> right, so you can begin by sort of uh, reinterpreting and contextualizing past experiences, and then once you've done that for a little bit of time, is that then you can kind of keep it in the back of your mind and change your perception of real time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, so he, and he makes that same point. He says, if you begin with small things and progress in small steps, eventually you'll be able to do it with bigger tr challenges. Um, and then he makes a, and then he gets to the the last type of patience, which is the way they translate here is uh, the patience that is devoted to a mind of certainty regarding the Dharma. Um, and this one, I actually think this kind of patience, like uh, I didn't understand. Uh, I guess I'll say this: like when I was first when I first heard Lama's teach, I didn't really understand what they were talking about. I didn't understand this one too well. It was like confusing to me. Uh, so I asked Kenshiro Bishay about it a bunch of times, and. Um, in part, what this one is getting at, they call it a mind of certainty regarding the Dharma. What they're really getting at is this, is like, I would say this, the way, this is the way I think of it anyway, is like, you know, there are certain kinds of insights for in, in the Buddhist context that we're actually, we're not capable of yet. Does that make sense? Like, for example, the ability to see emptiness directly. Some of you maybe <laughs> will do that. I, I don't think probably most of us can. So, um, that we're not actually capable of having that insight or of tolerating the awareness of the truth, in a sense. We're not capable of that. And so as you, so what, he's, what this is getting at is as you progress along the path, you develop a patience that's able to have certainty and have, what's the word he uses? Certainty regarding the Dharma or devotion. But it's really like the ability to, that you have this ability to sort of, uh, tolerate or, or ex and then experience an awareness of something. And I, actually, I'll, I'll say part of my own way of contemplating this, just my own personal reflection, is uh, because I, you know, those are like very advanced, right, seeing everything directly, so. But, you know, like, even in ordinary life, like, there are things that we can't yet, like ordinary, let's say, say this right, that people can't yet bear to be aware of. Like, they don't have the capacity yet, right? And then as you become more, what's the word? as your mind becomes more peaceful and more insightful and more bold or more strong or something, you can tolerate awareness of more things. Um, well, that applies, I guess, on a spiritual level to these advanced trainings. And so he's saying, how do you develop that? And by the way, I'll show one more thing. There, there's actually on the path of, right, there's the, in the five paths, there's the path of accumulation and the path of preparation. On the path of preparation, there's something called the patience level of the path of preparation. And there, the reason they call it the patience level is that the bodhisattva develops more of this ability to sort of tolerate the awareness, in that case, of emptiness. Um, and then as bodhisattvas go through the bhumis, they develop various levels of this kind of patience, the patience that's able to sort of have an insight. Um, and so he says, how do you develop that? And he says, um, he says so you start by training in devotion uh, to the three jewels, for example. Um, and then... Uh, you train in, and here he's saying you train in devotion without bias to things like the objects to be actualized, the two selflessness, so meaning emptiness, um, to the power of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, to the um, objects to be discarded, which are bad conduct, and the objects to be adopted, which are good conduct, and so on. Um, and so, and then he says, and also the Bodhisattva trainings, and basically in the commentary what it said is, you know, the way to do that is through studying, contemplating, and meditating. Really, that's the point. So that you, you have to contemplate, and there are two parts to what he's implying, or saying, or implying here. One is, like, let's say it this way, like, you have to kind of contemplate the goal, right? Like, why am I doing this? Why, why am I interested, for example, in having the insight into this? And if you understand from the Buddhist psychological teaching that that's the way to undermine all suffering, then you develop a kind of enthusiasm. For that, right? And then, if you study emptiness more and more, you develop the capacity, what's the word, to understand it more deeply, right? And to have a kind of certainty or a kind of confidence in it. And so there are two. There are two. I think there are two parts of this. One is sort of developing a kind of interest in a topic, right? Because seeing the benefits of it, and then the other is studying it and contemplating it more and more, 
so that your ability sort of deepens to have an insight into it, and that's the, that's where the certainty <coughs> does that make sense? Otherwise, it's kind of you can have an intellectual idea of something, but he's getting at this like a deepening process of in, of intensive study, contemplating, and meditating, and you have a capacity or a patience that's able to kind of have a certainty regarding that topic, and otherwise your understanding of a topic is just wishy-washy. Is it like sense? conviction? Yeah, conviction. That's what he says. Right. And that ends the section on patience. Next is the section on joyous effort. Any questions about that section before we go on? So you're saying that happens when you reach a path of accumulation, right? You get a special level of the patience. Of the that path means you've got to have like, clear, like, concentration. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you have to have common binding and special insight to so achieve that. I mean, if you have concentration, it's going to be easy anyway, right? Actually, in that case, you want to com you have to combine the concentration with what they call special insight, yeah. or uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so you, it, it, if to have that kind of patience, they, the person um, combines those two. So it's still be easy anyway. If you have concentration, it's easier. But if you don't combine it with special insight, that you wouldn't get to develop this kind of patience, though, because it, it, this is patience specifically. Because like so the reason I say that is like there are some people who have developed concentration, but they don't apply it to the, for example, to the nature of reality. They apply it to something else, like just having bliss or something. But they don't apply it to the nature of reality. So you have to apply it to the Dharma, or to emptiness in that case, for example, to, in order for it to become patience. Otherwise, you could just bliss out in a kind of concentrated state. <coughs> OK, so next comes joyous effort, the, which is um, the uh, fourth of the six perfections. Um, I'll start just by reading the, the definition. So Lama Tsongkhapa, uh, he defines the entity of joyous effort from uh, Asanga's Bodhisattva Bhumi, Bodhisattva levels. And he says, uh, in the Bodhisattva levels, joyous effort is explained as a mind that delights strongly for the sake of gathering virtue and working for the welfare of sentient beings, as well as the actions of the three doors motivated by it. So joyous effort is mainly, as all the bo uh, training, as all these um, perfections are, it's mainly a state of mind, right? So it's a state of mind that delights strongly or takes joy in virtue. Right? And then it's the th actions of body, speech, and mind, three doors, right? Body, speech, and mind, that are motivated by that kind of mind. Um, and so I just want to pause there and reflect together on something for a minute. Like, do you get, I mean, so, like, this is, I think, very important. Uh, definition. So like what it's getting at here, right, is that you cultivate a mind, right, and develop this mind that is joyful or happy or delighted to do dharma, right, real dharma, not like to do external actions, but to do the actual practice, right, of, of, of what's sort of cultivating love and compassion, for example, and so on. Um, and I just want to reflect, I think there's something to reflect on here that I just want to mention, which is like, Pause for a moment, because like I think sometimes we find like people. I mean, I, I mean we included me, me included, you know, find joy or delight in the weirdest things. Actually, like, you know, like, and what it's saying is like what, what you find. There's an impl implication here, which is, which I think, in order to understand the rest of this, is useful to reflect reflect on. Is again, like, really, it's true. People find delight or joy in just like weird stuff, right? Like, and if you go around like and ask people, like, or really analyze, like, what brings people joy? Like, you know, so like, actually, like, I remember, I, I remember thinking this, like, um, <laughs> so, like my uh, nephew at Christmas was teaching me, like, a card game. It was total luck, you know, it was, there was no strategy at all in the game, really. I, at least I thought I could discern. <laughs> um, and, like, if you got the better cards, right, and therefore when you put it down, you won, then there was, you were supposed to feel joy. But it was just, like, randomly, it was totally random, right, who was... Who was handed those cards? And then if you put down the like, you know, if, but actually poker, I guess, is pretty similar. I don't know. Like, I mean, there's people find joy in the weirdest stuff, right? Like, oh, I got a this card. I got a card that has this picture on it, not that picture on it. I'm so joyful. Right? Or um, I was noticing it recently with like people feeling, and no no insult to those present, but sometimes people feeling like incredible joy. That's a bunch of people won in a football game or something like lately, and it's like, you know, I was like. You didn't even play. Like, why are you so joyful? <laughs> I'm teasing a little bit. But, um, you know, like, 
anyways, I, and I guess my point is, is like, and then like, actually, if you really get into people's psychology, they like, you find joy in any weird thing, and and the point being like, it's conditioned. Does that make sense? Like, what we find joy in is a conditioned um, habit. And, you know, actually, sometimes what you find joy in, of course, other people find <coughs> terrible, right? Like, they find it terribly miserable. And here, what it's getting at is that what bodhisattvas cultivate, so there's, there's a process, actually, right, of, like, watch, the, to actually practice this, you would have to check for yourself, well, what do I find, what do I delight in, right? And you have to find, like, if you, if what you're delighting in, this is what we're going to get into in a minute, in detail, is either non-virtuous or meaningless, because so, there could be either, right? Now, non, sometimes we delight in non-virtuous things, like, you know, oh, I really insulted that person, yes, right? Um, or sometimes, or a lot of the time, we delight in just stuff that's meaningless, right? Like, um, and, they're and here they include meaningless. They include, for example, like Lama Sankapa would include getting a raise, or like finding a new partner, or like there is none of that has any real meaning at all. Like. It'll be dead and nobody cared. It has no particular significance. Um, and so what they're getting at here is training or learning to find joy in what's actually meaningful. Right? So finding joy in what? In helping others. Finding joy in what? In By gathering virtue, by the way, here it says, finding joy, delight strongly for the sake of two things. Working for the welfare of others, so acting with compassion. And by gathering virtue, what do you mean? What they, in the definition, what they say, what does that mean? It means practicing the six perfections. So it means having joy in those things, and um, and sort of not, uh, what's the word? Finding other things not particularly, you know, like um, de what's the word? Leaving them aside or sort of la having less interest in them. That's the um, okay. So now Lama Sokapa gets into the three types of joyful effort. Um, so the first one is armor-like joyful effort. Um, and, and he says, uh, when bodhisattvas undertake joyous effort, prior to applying themselves, they put on the armor of the thought that first delights the mind. They delight, uh, thinking, even, if they, uh, even at, if they are to attain Buddhahood after abiding only in hell for 100,000 times 10 million rounds of the three immeasurable eons, in order to limit the, one sense, uh, the suffering of one sentient being, they'll be delighted. Um, and so this actually, I want to point out something, armor, right? What's the idea of armor? It's a metaphor, right? It comes from India because, uh, you know, Buddhist authors were writing during kind of a time in India where soldiers were, I guess soldiers still were armor. Right? Um, so what it's getting at is this here. It says before, Lama Sokapa mentions before. So the idea here is before you start to engage in action, you put on your armor. Does that make sense? And what's that armor? The armor is the thought. Actually, what you have to think is this, is because it, it's implied here, right? it's, it's really what he's saying, is if you're going to do something that's meaningful, that's virtuous, that's positive, right? that you pause first and you, th you actually think, well, first of all, why am I doing this? Is there some meaning to it? Right? And you contemplate the meaning until you realize, until you think to yourself, well, if this, like for example, let's say it's an act of love, right? or a practice of love, you know, or something like that, where you develop this feeling like, or thought, well, this is the most important thing, actually. Nothing else is as imp important as this. So I don't care what obstacles I have. This is the armor, right? I don't care if obstacles arise. I don't care if it's difficult. I don't care if everybody else says I'm stupid for doing it. I don't care, like, about any of those things, because this is important. This is meaningful. This is, like, the purpose of life. You know what I mean? And you put on your armor that's kind of like, no matter what it takes, I'm going to bring this to completion. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to... You know what I mean? And you develop a kind of, um, that's what the armor is. Does that make sense? It's like you're doing that beforehand, is the point. Like you're sort of like developing your enthusiasm, and it's a psychological armor, right? That's saying, of course there'll be difficulties, right? Like especially if you're trying to become enlightened, right? Like you've never done that before. It's going to be not easy, you know? And so you have to think, like, or whatever, you're trying to practice compassion, and you've been selfish up to now, right? Like, well, that's not going to be easy, you know? But the idea is like, you, so you contemplate, well, okay, so I've been a selfish kind of person, but compassion is the most important, like, you know, it's the main topic of all the Dharma. And it's the main thing that makes oneself happy and others happy. And so you think, well, I don't care if my habit of selfishness comes up. I don't care if, like, my old friends think I'm not cool anymore because I'm doing something different. I don't care if 
I developed a kind of discomfort because I'm not comfortable doing something new. Like, all that doesn't matter because this is that important. You know, and I'm going to develop a kind of enthusiasm and bravery and um, joy in doing this. And, um, oh, sorry, say it right. Like, you know, and it, like, this is not, so, I mean, it, what seems, I think, sometimes odd or new to people is applying that to spiritual practice. Because actually, like, people do that all the time for, again, like, uh, this is pointing out, for the weirdest stuff, right? Like, um, like we think, actually, I'm just sure, like, like, we think it's nothing, right? Like, I, I've, I think I've mentioned that before, like, Lama Zorba, like, the, um, Lama Zorba, she often points out, like, people make unbelievable effort and bear incredible hardships, like, to play an Olympic sport, right? Which just means, like, they ran faster than somebody else, right? Like, no offense to that, but like, or they skied faster than somebody else, you know, be, um, like, so what? I mean, no offense, again, like, I feel, you know, we're the same thing, right? Like, we think it's totally normal, right? Like, if somebody thinks they're going to win the Super Bowl, so, right, like, they can make incredible, like, if they were to, like, risk getting brain damage, which they are doing, right? We, we, people say, that's great, you know, like, who cares? Like, they're going to, they won the Super Bowl, like, you know, it doesn't matter if they're brain damaged the rest of their life. Um, because they're like brave and they're great, you know, like, and the point being like, I was saying, those are actually things that don't have any meaning, right? Like, so we should have at least as much bravery and strength as an Olympic athlete or as a f professional football player if we're going to try to practice Dharma. But who has that, right? Who develops that kind of joyful effort, right? And there's a joy, right? Like, there's when somebody like thinks, oh, I'm going to like win the gold medal or I'm going to win the Super Bowl or I'm going to win the World Series, right? Like, you see, actually, you see them when they, like, win, right there. <coughs> like that, right? <coughs> There's, like, incredible energy and joy. And so what Lama Sankapa is saying here is you should have that kind of, like, cultivate that kind of joy as joyful effort. Does that make sense? We were, like, you know, like, if you said to, actually, like, if you said to an Olympic athlete, like, now, right, when the Olympics start soon, don't they? Mm -hmm. So if you said to them, well, why don't you take a couple weeks off? Who cares? Right? Like, they would say, like, like, they would think you're insane, right? They would say, this is what's important. Like, this is the most important thing of my entire existence, right? <laughs> I say that, I think of that, fame. I remember as a kid reading the story of um, Muhammad Ali, you know, after he won the gold medal, then he came back to America, and he uh, went back to the South, and he realized, well, he experienced racism, right? And he thought, I won on behalf of this country, and now people are streaming that way. He took his gold medal, and he threw it in the river. Um, it's a famous moment in his life where he just kind of thought, doesn't have any meaning to me, this gold medal. Right? Um, whereas if you have success in the practice of practice cultivating enlightenment, um, that has a kind of, what's the word? That'll never, it'll never disappoint you, is the idea. So you develop a kind of armor-like enthusiasm up front. I've got a question. Okay. So the way I kind of see this is that when you're developing something that you really enjoy doing, it's important to get positive feedback, at least in the beginning. Uh, after you've been doing it for a long time, is that you kind of establish a habit and that you can take a string of losses and you'll still probably keep at it. So in Buddhist practice, do they have anything where they talk about their successes or this happened, this is the way I interpreted it, you know, and then it was okay? Did they ever share, or is this very internal? Well, actually, we'll get to it. There's a section on what helps, and, and some of that is in there. So yeah, it'll come. But um, but I'll make a comment about that, like, because I think you're right. You know, when I look, if I look at, like, if you, if you look at, like, people who practice Dharma, meditation, so on, you'll see, actually, right, like, some people, um, will have great enthusiasm at the beginning, and then they completely stop. Right. Right? And that's kind of the thing you're, I mean, it, that's where the person is not getting the positive well, right. feedback. And, and the way the brain and works, they should stop. Right, it's it's that that you get that dopamine burst, and that you know you feel successful, and that to make it easier to kind of establish that pathway in the brain is to have a string of wins. And if you have a string of wins in the row, and it's already established in your brain, it's going to take a lot to get rid of that. So typically people that get into gambling, if you have never gambled in your life and you win a couple times in a row, you're in a bad spot. Because <laughs> your brain perceives yeah. it as a rewarding activity. No, I know what you mean. Yeah, and I guess I would say from here, from, I mean, from this teaching, and again, we'll get into it more as we go further into it, but I think there are two key points at the beginning. One is uh, contemplating the benefit, you know, like, like in other words, uh, because, you know, like, in other words, uh, thinking about why am I doing this, what are the benefits, you know, and, and sort of seeing the benefits of something. That's one thing Lama Sankar is implying, or saying, actually. And that's like, um, 
actually, if you talk to kids, for example, who are starting to do some activity, right, they'll be like, or, or even a video game, right, they'll be like, oh, it's awesome. You know, they'll tell you all the benefit, like, oh, it's wonderful, and you get to the 17th level, you know, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like that, right? It's like, it's basic psychology, as you think about it. There's, the, so the first step is think about the benefits and get motivated. But then, in terms of what you were saying about the uh, having successes, um, I think that's also important. And one thing I would say is, like a mistake people make, I think, is either trying to do, and this is, and I'm gonna, again, I'll get into it more, so I don't want to go too into detail, but it's actually being careful at the beginning to set yourself up for success. You know, so if, for example, I've seen where people will, like, you know, even though the Lam Rim is very clear about the sequence of meditations, people will sort of say, you know, um, oh, you know, it's been so cool, and I'm going to jump right into practicing Mahamudra and Tantra or something. And of course, then they didn't do the preliminaries, and they're trying to intensively do something that's they're not capable of doing, and they fail. They don't have good experience. So if you set the bar well, it's easy to hop over it and consider that a win. And that's what Lama Sankara, that's what the Lama yeah. Rim is for. There is you, yeah. you start at the beginning, you know. So and the same thing with meditation, for example. Like the advice, and again, people don't do this oftentimes. But the advice we'll get to in the section on calm abiding is you start with really brief very well done sessions. And if you do that, you start to experience a kind of the pleasure of meditation, for example. There's a kind of intrinsic pleasure as you progress a little bit, each step of you, as you progress in your concentration, it gives a feeling of physical and mental happiness, actually. And that works really well if you start with really short sessions that are done very well and you progress in that way and you get, you develop, you know, there are like nine levels of concentration. It's not hard to get from the first, the second, maybe up to the third where you start to have these, ex just some ple pleasant experience. But instead, what people do is they go, like, they'll oftentimes go do some, they'll think, oh, well, I'll sit for a long time, and I've seen somebody else do that, and they sort of sit there. And then they're just feeling, what's the word, agitated, because they're not able to concentrate that long. And it's just a kind of, what's the word, mentally agitating experience. Of course they're going to give up. Like, it's not pleasant, you know. Whereas if you start, again, you start with, like you're saying, you know, set the bar lows, make it simple, do short sessions, you know, and then you start to see, wow, I can concentrate better over, over three weeks. I'm getting better at this. You know, you start to feel both a sense of encouragement that you're getting better and also the physical feeling and mental feeling of joy that comes with that. That's actually a side effect of meditation. And so you want to meditate more. Whereas if you set it up wrong, either if you're doing the wrong practice, something too advanced, or you're pushing it for too long, you just get frustrated. And of course people give up. Like, because it doesn't work. Because that's not the way it's taught. You do it the wrong way, and then you don't have success. And then, so if you set it, if you do it in the way it's advised, starting small, and starting with small steps, yeah, and like you're saying, setting the bar low, you jump over that bar, and then you can jump higher and higher until you're in the, the uh, whatever, you know, the, the high jump of. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just kind of wondering. So within Tibet, you know, among the lay people, I think that'd be helpful. So that's a very internalized reward system, but also you have the reward system of social validation. And mm -hmm. so, for example is that today in Western society, there's not a lot of social validation for being religious or being successful, you know, internally in that way. And it occurred to me is that with the Buddhist monks, so for example, a monk meditates for like six hours straight. And that the other monks are like, oh, wow, that's incredible. You know, you did that. You know, this is the greatest monk ever, he or she. And that they get validation for that. And that, you know, they may not admit that they get validation for that, that, you know, this is, I like the fact that people can appreciate that they did that. But at some point, they register that. Whereas if you went out to the general populace, you said, I meditate for six hours, they're like, that's all you did? Don't yeah, you know what well, to do? Actually, it was interesting. I, I mean, the, I shall just share as a side. If I think of the monks, I, mean, the, I wasn't there that long, but the times I've been at monasteries, oftentimes actually they won't get, uh, what they actually get initially, I mean, the younger, as they're early on at least, maybe later they would. Because early on, what they're doing is they're meditating and they're debating. And so there's a ton of that. I mean, they're not meditating, they're memorizing rather and debating. And they get a ton of what you're describing, actually. Because, whereas if you succeed in memorizing the text first, of course, especially among young, uh, mm -hmm. young people, right? It's like, you know, oh, that person memorized more pages, and then they're debating, and of course, if you win the, they have a part, a lot of their way of study is debate. Right. And so, you know, if they've studied more and contemplated more, and then when they uh, have success in the debate, of course, it's fun. You know, like, it's, it's uh, they're learning, and, they're, and the idea is they're supposed to help each other, but it's fun. You know, it's something fun about, oh, I had this insight, and, I got it, you know, in a way that um, I was the first one to get that point, and then I helped other people get it too. So it's not so much a competition, but a sort of sense of mastery that comes. Um, and my impression is that gives them a lot of uh, what you're describing, reinforcement. Uh, yeah. I think also to go to your point is um, 
I am having a hard time articulating it, but there's a whole part about having the right friends. Mm -hmm. So if you're the right friends, and when you share, like I just meditated even for five minutes, <laughs> they're like really, really applauding you rather than wondering why you're trying to put this effort out. Um, so I think then that's why Sangha is important. Yeah, that's going to come in the section on, in the section here. I mean, I agree with you. And the, yeah. Lama Sankapa has a section on um, finding conducive, what's the word, creating conducive conditions for the development of joyful effort. And one of them is exactly what you said, having the right friends and not having the wrong friends. Because he makes the point, even a person who has a tendency towards joyful effort, especially as early on in their practice, if they hang out with the wrong friends, their joyful effort will decrease because, again, because just they're hearing the cognition of, Oh, what's meaningful? Like, you know, um, in the comment, in one commentary, the guy was saying, the Lama, this Lama was saying, um, you know, if, if all you hear is like, oh, what's really great though is getting drunk and, uh, you know, whatever, something like that. That if that's all you hear, and if you always hear, oh, but meaningful things are meaningless, that you're, you know, it's going to be very hard to make progress. Whereas if you're around people who are encouraging, and and where also you see them practicing joyfully, he was also making this point. When you see also them practicing joyful, so they, well, if they give you positive feedback, well, so you watch them doing it, um, then it encourages you. Yeah. So having the right friends is, yeah, I agree. And Lama Sakaba agrees. <laughs> so what about like the yogis that like go on a retreat or something like that? Because they don't they don't get any feedback, positive nor negative. So and there's you know they experience you know, extreme joy, yeah. right? They love what they do. <coughs> well, part of that, I, guess, I think, actually, is that, um, let's see, say it right, like, I think, I think part of this, the question you were raising, which I think was a good question, and uh, but you were actually raising it as for beginners. Right. It's different um, at, the beginning at the beginning. The end, because in the beginning, you want to change your brain to make it a rewarding activity. Is that once your brain has already established those pathways, is that it's not necessary to have as strong as input and I'll likely be able to continue with sort of minimal effort. And so I think part of what your point about yogis is like, I mean, somebody, actually, like, uh, <laughs> my sister went to a yo this yogi in Nepal and said, oh, I'm thinking of doing, her and her friend went, and she told me this story, I wasn't there, but she went to this like, great yogi in Nepal, and they said, oh, we're thinking of going up to the Himalayas to do a retreat. And he said, he said to them, he said, um, he said well, you, for you, that'll be like being in prison. Why would you want to do that? You know, like, now he had lived in, for years and years in the Himalayas and all that, you know, but he said, why would you want to do that? You, you'll experience it like you're in prison. Don't do that. He's and they said, well, what if, they, they were saying, oh, we want to do like a month or something. And then they were like, well, would it be okay if we did like a few days? And he's like, keep it short, but yeah, all right, you know, like, and so they went and did a short retreat. Um, the point being, he was saying, don't become, you know, don't try to be like, you, you won't, you won't find joy in it. And therefore you'll just think, why did I do that? Right? He was like, keep it short, because then you'll maybe think, oh, that was fun. You know, like I enjoyed it it's in terms of joyful effort, right? Uh, whereas for him, of course, you know, he could go away for three, four years and just meditate and, um, and be totally joyful. But it was because he had, um, he had already experienced actually the, you know, the bliss of meditation. And so for him, you know, he would go off and it, it was an experience of um, bliss. But also, he had this kind of joy, he had the armor-like enthusiasm, where even if the obstacles came, he had a very strong mind and was very kind of energetic. So, so you said, like, uh, <coughs> you said, okay. Like, uh, Joyful is for determination is a is a state of mind, right? Mm -hmm. Joyful so, effort, yeah. So if you're driven by attachment, strong attachment, so is there a, a joyful effort behind it? No, because it has to be. Remember, he says that's why important. Yeah. It has to be joy, 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 and delight in either practicing the six perfections or helping others. So are you born with that joyful? Are you born with joyful effort? Is it a part of the? positive emotions or you just or you have to cultivate it you have to cultivate it is what he's saying so yeah I mean how do you cultivate that I mean. so that's what we're about to get to oh. yeah so he teaches that now okay. um, or he teaches more about that actually uh, there are two more points and then he starts to say how to cultivate that is right it comes very soon now how mm -hmm. to cultivate but so um so anyway the, the last two he gives two more kinds of joyful which he covers very briefly so I'll just mention them next is the joyful effort of gathering virtuous dharmas. This is the joyous effort of gathering virtuous dharmas is to apply yourself for them for the sake of accomplishing the six perfections. So the first one was armor-like, right? So that was developing the kind of armor or strength before you start. This is why you're doing it, right? You kind of cultivate a sense of joy. Like, oh, this is great. You know, you actually, like, um, 
enthusiasm and joy and sort of uh, delight. Um, and then the last one of the three is the joyous effort of working for the welfare of sentient beings, and that's similar. So there are two types there. One is while you're practicing the six perfections to cultivate joy and delight, and the, and the last one is while working for the sake of others, right? Because those are two different. Um, when you're actually, it's an important point. When you're cultivating the six perfections, that's mainly, uh, those are mainly practices that lead you to enlightenment for the sake of others, right? Uh, which is different than when you're mainly focused on directly helping others. Does that make sense? Um, and so those are two different things. So you're cultivating joy in those two kinds of activities. Right? One is practicing six perfections, and the other is when you're directly helping others. Uh, so now he gets into how do you cultivate it. And so, um, and I started to talk about this already, but the, so the first step is, like with anything, and actually this is important, like, uh, like I was already saying about it, this. The first step is, what's 36 right now? is developing an appreciation for why do I want to cultivate joyful effort, right? Like, in other words, that unless you see the benefits of something, you won't start to cultivate it. And um, again, I'll, I'll just emphasize, you know, I was saying earlier, like, we all, as human beings, develop um, delight in all kinds of weird stuff, right? Like, and part of that is actually marketing, right? Like, in other words, like, so people, um, so people like develop incredible like enthusiasm for having things like and a lot of this but you know like late I was th what was it? I was thinking about that like um I don't know every time I hear that word like branding it, you know like they talk about the like, creating it makes me nauseous a little bit like <laughs> that's just my own personal reaction like oh that's, you know you have, you have to like a uh, create a brand for yourself like uh, no no offense if you like that I, just, I find it. Uh, Something that makes me feel slightly sick. The idea of, like, I'm going to have a brand, the Lord brand. Or something. It seems like, um, <laughs> it's huge ridiculous. But, um, so I just have a personal reaction to that. But, um, but marketing is, is like, right, is developing, what's the word? Like, a sense of this is the best thing since sliced bread, right? This is so great, you know, and like, and that, I guess that's what it is, right? Like, so somebody has a, a certain kind of car, and then, oh, wow, I get that kind of car, you know, or something, or, but it's not, it's like also, um, you know, clothing brand, right? Like, oh, you have, you're wearing that brand, that's so amazing, or something. Um, but so it's through, like, having some idea that that's beneficial, right? So here, and so here, all I'm saying is, that's fundamental to human psychology, right? That there is, it's like, when you see something as beneficial, then you want that. Uh, or you want to have that, or cultivate that, or whatever. So here, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, the first step to developing joyful effort is to have a kind of sense of what are the benefits and what are the uh, flaws of not having. So he starts with the benefits. Um, and it says, uh, he quotes uh, Maitreya's uh, ornament for Mahayana Sutras, where he says, joyous effort is the best uh, virtue, basically. Right, we're on page 188. So, uh, basically what that first, uh, first line means is, joyous effort is the best of all the virtues. And he says, uh, thus relying on it, one attains that which follows. And now he's describing what, what are the benefits. Right? So this is Maitreya teaching, what are the benefits of joyful effort. So first he says, through joyous effort, immediately, best source of happiness, including mundane and super mundane attainments. So what he's saying there is, whether you want to attain um, mundane, meaning like uh, ordinary, or a super mundane, meaning like enlightenment, they all come through joyful effort. Does that make sense? Like, so there's all the different progress in your spiritual practice and also in your mental happiness come about through joyful effort. And if you don't make any joyful effort, you're not going to make any progress. Then he says, through joyous <coughs> effort, one gains worldly wealth one desires. Right? And so from a Buddhist perspective, what's the cause of wealth? Right? From karma, what's the cause of wealth? Generosity. Right? So in other words, um, so the practice of generosity, which leads to having enough, um, comes through joyful effort. It doesn't just happen... Uh, what's the word? Uh, by itself. Uh, through joyous effort, one becomes totally pure, right? That means like an Arya, or, and then a Buddha. One gains the qualities of an enlightened being. Through joyful effort, one is liberated, right? So the liberation from samsara only comes about through joyful effort. Um, passing beyond the transitory collection, that means passing beyond, um, you know, the aggregates conditioned by ignorance. Um, through joyful effort, one awakes to supreme enlightenment, meaning Buddhahood itself, right? So Maitreya is saying all those things come about through joyful effort. 
Hey, Lauren, before, um, I, I think I had a question, uh, the, the prior section here. So, <clears throat> so you're talking about, you know, like developing joy or getting joyful about, you know, particularly before you start, you know, virtuous activity or an activity, say, for example, like, you know, feel joyful about it. So what's the difference between that and uh, pleasure? Like, you get joyful about something or you get pleasure f from something. Is that like the element of attachment that is involved? Or? No, the examples, it's, it's, when you're using the examples about like, <coughs> like if you win the Super Bowl or, or, or the Olympics or, to me, like I, I'm seeing that like, it's like pleasure, like you get pleasure from those things, but you're, but you're saying like joy and I think there's a difference, like joyful effort and just deriving pleasure from something or, is that a, what's No, I think it's the same thing. I think the idea though is that, the idea that's being suggested here is that you like you train yourself to find that pleasure uh, maybe you know, she said, in what's virtuous rather than what's not virtuous and actually I'm gonna give an example of what I mean like uh, you have kids right like so there's like if you see like a little tiny kid right and they pick up something like um, let's say they're like you know they're in the grass like so you're in summertime and you're outside and they're in the grass and like I'll give an example like and suddenly they come across like somebody left it there and they come across a piece of dog poop Right, and they think, like, oh, what's that? And they start to play with it, right? And they're like happy. They're smiling because they found something they think is, they don't know, and they think it's like um, <laughs> pleasant. Right? Kids will do that, right? Um, and so they're finding pleasure in that at that moment, right? And then if you're a parent, like you say, oh my God, no, hey, that's not that. You know, you the, you take that away from you, say that's dirty, yuck, oh, and you start like, you know, you get like whatever disinfecting wipes, and you're doing all that. Right? Um, and then the kid looks like. You know, like, right? And then, like, you say, that's dirty, that's filthy. Oh, don't touch that. You know, like, right, you get sick or something like that, right? Because you're being a parent, right? And so the point being, the child found pleasure in that at first, right? Now, if that happens once, maybe twice, then the child's going to see, when they see, actually, like, if you see, I just the other day, you know, I, I go for a walk, right? And then I guess you talk to them, like, oh, somebody left that there, right? Like, they should have cleaned that up. You know, I have that thought. I'm almost like, some, probably like a look of disgust on my face, right? And like, so I learned that I, I like I learned that reaction from my mom, as a, mm. probably a toddler or something. Right? And so my point is, is like, we find pleasure in certain things that are actually not that aren't good for us. Right? And then somebody who's more wise than us teaches us, no, that's not a good source of pleasure. And maybe the parent then you know gives the kid a toy, like a toy, a, a toy where they can like develop their neurological thing. And good, that's great. So the point being, like. You learn to like you learn to find your joy in something better, that's safer and healthier and more positive for you. So that's what it's getting at here. Like so, there was, so if somebody like um, so like if the person fi like finds their joy in, um, you know, I, if I find my joy in running faster than somebody else, right? But then I'm like relating to the Buddha. The Buddha might say, well, you know, like beating somebody else in a race isn't um, isn't the most important thing in life. You know, more important that might, might be serving those other people and being a kind and being a compa uh, being compassionate to them and, and helping them, uh, help you know, benefiting them, right? And then if you start to contemplate enough, you go, oh wow, like it's almost like so you, it's like you leave beside one thing and focus on another. The same way as the poop, right? <laughs> like so you start to develop a kind of sense of um, oh, I'll find pleasure in something more pure or more virtuous or more beneficial. Uh, so I think it's still pleasure, oh. but it's like switching your source of pleasure to something better mm -hmm. for you and others in the long run. That's the idea. So I think it's still pleasure, actually. It's just uh, not with attachment, but a sense of, um, I mean, it's not, because it's not an exaggeration, right? It's a, it's a correct discernment. Oh, this is an actual source of happiness. I want to do that. And then finding pleasure in that. Um, so I think pleasure is a good thing in that sense. Was that, I don't know, was that... Yeah, I would just thought it was something different from pleasure. Like, it was something, it was some other quality that made it different from just pleasure. Uh, like, pleasure seems mundane, but, like, joyful effort doesn't seem mundane or something like that. Yeah, no, I really do think it's that. Like, it's, like, similar to, um... Let's say it right. Like, 
you know, it was this point, like I'll just give an example, it was this point that like, I, I mean, uh, I'll give it, uh, I've said, that, I've told this brief story before, but I remember one time, like, I, I told that story where, uh, you know, Reba Rinpoche, it was personal with me, like, where I was driving him to the doctor in the morning, and I'm not a morning person, and you notice that, and, but anyway, his point was, he said, you know, he said, oh, wow, a lot of people right now, this morning, are hunters, and they're getting their pleasure from sitting in a, like, they're up early, you know, sitting in a thing waiting to shoot an animal. You know, and then he said, but you're getting, you're doing it through helping somebody, him. Mm -hmm. you know. And he said, how much better, that's great. Like, how much better is that, right? So he was actually drawing, he was making this point about joyful love, but he was drawing a direct parallel. He's saying, well, some people find their pleasure through killing. Um, and he was, well, that's a terrible, you know, he didn't say this, but that was implied. That's a terrible source of pleasure, right? Like, if you find your pleasure by killing somebody or something, you know, that's a horrible mm -hmm. source of pleasure. Yeah. But if you find your pleasure by helping somebody, uh, that's beautiful, you know. And so he was saying that's the idea, actually. You know, it, it was an implication of what he was saying, right? It, it was that we want to sort of train ourselves to find our pleasure in what's wonderful. So I, I think it actually, you know, I mean, his point was that is pleasure, right? He was, he was saying, <laughs> but find your pleasure in this rather than that. You know. Um. Uh, Lauren, I have a question. Who's responsible for organizing events for the uh, this center? Uh, Dr. Oh, really? Yeah. It just occurred to me to say, I think that the Friends is very important to have an a informal social group that can validate your experience. But I think a formal group, sort of like a joyful effort development group, where people could come and they're like, oh, I'm kind of new to this. This is where I was successful. This is where it was kind of difficult. People could talk about it. It would be helpful. Sounds good. Yeah, talk more to Dr. See what his thoughts are. Yeah. Uh, how, maybe you're answering this and I'm just not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> but, where, like, there is, like, getting a raise is beneficial because then it, well, I guess, like, it could go either way. Like, you could be spending more money on, like, plasma TVs or you could be, like, donating it or, like, being able to actually pay your bills and not be in debt. I mean, like, there, yeah. there's, like, you can look at it from, like, there's, with, like, a bodhicitta motivation. Right. But I have a disconnect, like, of throughout the day, like, maintaining that, like, joy, like, the reasons of why these things are good, like, the reasons of why, like, getting the raise or, like, eating proper meals, you know, like, making sure I, like, do my meal prep and actually take the time to eat good food rather than just an energy bar. I have a hard time maintaining that, like, the real reasons behind doing these things throughout the day, or even sometimes throughout the week. <laughs> and you mean, because what happens instead? I just am doing them. Or like, like, del like getting delight out of like, for instance, like having a partner, like there's like, you're able to develop love, you know, if it's a positive relationship, you can develop love and makes the other person's life really nice and you can like there's like some not so mundane things. I mean there's yeah. also mundane things so like it's part of yeah. yeah, but then like I don't I'm just like on autopilot or just like not maintain like not seeing a bodhicitta motivation or not seeing like a deeper reason um of like going out with friends or like I get it. Yeah, but how, how, I can, like, if I, like, look at the benefits, I can, like, find good benefits from there, so, for the most part, <coughs> these things, but I don't, I can't, like, carry that with me. Maybe, but I'll share one thought I have. It's not directly related to what I was saying here, but I think it's, I think it's related, related. is, um, you know, ordinarily, like, at the beginning, like, you know, if, like, if you think of a, uh, the advice of the, uh, the lineage, right? The like sort of advice. It, like, actually starts right where people like lamas, like lamas over here often say, like, "Oh, you start your morning by thinking about bodhicitta and why am I going about my day?" And like, you know, you, you can do a, you can do a whole contemplation right in the morning or something, you know, and you set your motivation for the day as bodhicitta, right? But then actually, there's a recognition I think in, in the lineage that. Um, that's the first step in training, but of course that doesn't sustain you 
like nobody, like uh, there's almost nobody who sets their motivation like that in the morning and then all day they're just in bodhicitta, like it doesn't happen, right? Like, so then they say, okay, well then add in at night, right? We should, like do it then at night, right? But then um, one time, uh, and you know, but then of course that's still not enough, right? Because the days are kind of long, right? And if you get up early to go to work and then there's a lot of things going on and a lot of like interactions and then, you know, it's many hours later when you go to sleep or before bed or something, that's definitely not, it, it helps, like it's a beginning point. Right, but that's not enough. And one time, um, uh, this was very helpful to me personally, I remember, like was um, some years ago, Gibi Kensha Rinpoche said, he was, t actually he was t talking about, there's like the, um, in, it was related, it was, he was actually explaining in highest Yoga Tantra, there's the practice of the six session Guru Yoga. And so, but um, in general, there's an advice to, pra to cultivate Bodhicitta six times a day, you know, um, and take refuge six times a day, for example, and so on. And he was making this point, he was saying, you know, some some people do that, like, you know, so there's like, so they took a commitment, right, to say, take refuge and develop bodhicitta six times. So some people, they'll say, like, they'll do, um, in the morning, they'll say, you know, like, they'll basically, I, you know, I go for refuge and I cultivate bodhicitta. I go for refuge and I cultivate bodhicitta. I go for refuge and I cultivate bodhicitta. Okay, that's three. I go to work, you know, <laughs> then at night before I go to bed. You know, because they took a commitment, so they recite something three times at night. And, of course, that's not the intention, right? Like, there was, what they were really getting at, if you look at, like, the, um, why did the lineage masters and the Buddha teach that? Is what they were actually saying was, and Rinpoche was saying that he was saying, like, um, what, what would it be every four hours or something, right? Like, or every, you know, if you do it every, and so one point would be if you, so Rinpoche was saying, if you pause, uh, you know, three times during your workday, let's say, or four times during your workday, and really pause to contemplate for five minutes, it doesn't be long, bodhicitta and so on, you know, that that will start to permeate the day in a very different way. Um, so that's one, you know, one advice that I found very helpful. And then another w thing that I personally have found out, it came from Lama Zubramashi actually, was like, was to create, and actually this is a, really, it was, it's actually psychological, but it was, it, it was Rinpoche's advice that was very helpful that, to me. It was, it was this idea, so that was one, was sort of, if you pause throughout the day, it's going to be more continuous. And then another was if you develop associations. So like, you know, like Lama Zopershay often teach when he teaches uh, bodhicitta mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. But like, I know for me, I'll give an example. Like for me personally, like, um, like so when I get to work, there's like, I walk up the steps. Right? And so like I, I cultivated a habit. I was like, okay, when I walk up the steps, I want to remember. Like first of all, the, I'm going to think like, okay, this symbolizes, um, you know, going up to enlightenment or something. And then I'll think, and I'm go why am I going up there? Well, my office is up there and I want to help others. You know, and like, if I become enlightened, you know, like, that's, it's symbolic, right? I want to go up to enlightenment and it be a benefit to others, but my purpose of going up these steps is actually to help other people. Um, and then, like, you know, each time I would go to the restroom, I'd be like, okay, <coughs> that's the time to pause and cultivate bodhicitta or something. You know, and like, so I guess my point is, is like, you, like, if you start to create associations to various things mm -hmm. related to your routines, like um, or if I get in the car, I'll say, okay, I'm gonna pause and do a succession guru yoga or something. Like I'll before I start driving, I'll do that or somewhere as I'm driving. My, my point being, if you create associations to various things, like throughout your normal life, and then you and then it causes you to do that, then over time you sort of go, oh wow, like it's starting to seep into, like um, how like water seeps into things, like it starts to be, oh, it's seeping into this activity now because, you know, if if I did it right then, you know, like, that, you know, like, so if you, like, like, so, so for example, if I took a bathroom break and I took a bodhicitta and then I'm walking back to the office, well, it's going to sort of start to influence that next period of time. And if you start doing that with, through more things, it starts to, like, seep into more things. So I think that's the way to do it. And I think it's, so it's, the problem is if we only do it in the morning, of course it's not going to be enough. <laughs> yeah. But does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. For me, I find it very difficult to understand joyful effort. <coughs> I mean, I've read many stuff about it, about it over and over and over. So is it like, uh, is it like you have sex, right? So does that mean like, is it like fun? This fun you achieve from this thing? Yeah, so it'd be like that. Yeah, it's actually good. So you, did you hear what he was saying? Yeah. He was, uh, he was saying um, it's hard to understand joyful effort, right? And then you said, yeah. you said, um, you basically were saying sex is fun. Yeah. So it's joyful effort like that, but towards Dharma. Is that your question? Yeah. And yeah, that's it. like, I remember uh, actually you invited Venerable Paula to come teach. And at the time she was, she's not a nun now. She was a nun at the time. And she was saying, <laughs> she was saying like, um, she was saying like, 
What did you say to me? You know, she had done like two, two, she did two three-year retreats, right? Three. Two, yeah, two, three? Three, I can't remember. Two, or two four-year retreats. She, and then she did the, she did a lot of, anyway, she's done a lot of retreats. But she was saying that she was, one time she said to me, she was a nun at the time, she said, you know, like when I was young in college, like I liked to stay up all night having sex. And then she said, now I like to stay up all night doing practice. Um, it's changed, you know, like what I find my pleasure. And that's what, it goes back to your question, Gabe. Like what she was saying was like, now my source of pleasure is, is that. Uh, and I have the same, and she was saying like, and it feels kind of like that. She was saying like, like, oh, how fun. Like she was like, in college I was like, oh, how fun. I get to stay up with this new guy, you know, like who I fell in love with. She's like, now I get to think, oh, how fun. I get to stay up and do like a practice. So it was like that, yeah. It was See, actually, that's what she found in Dharma. Yeah, that it's, that it's like your sense of like excitement and joy and pleasure. It come from that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she said it's substitute, one substitute for the other. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, next point. So then he uh, quotes uh, the Compendium of Perfections. So it says, for him who has great joyous effort and does not dismay, right? So does not dismay means like, Right? That's important, right? That the person doesn't get dismayed or discouraged, right? Um, there is nothing that can't be attained <laughs> and that can't be accomplished. And actually, I, I'm going to say something about that point. Like, or actually, well, maybe we'll get into it more later. Yeah, I'll just keep going. Um, but, well, actually, okay. Well, like, so there are two points that he's saying in this quote, right? One is, if you have joyful effort, it stops you from getting discouraged and dismayed, right? Another point is, and actually, this is important. You, like, the idea here, right? Actually, this is, is this is important. So, what it's saying is, for you, right? If you make effort, there's nothing you can't attain, right? And so, actually, you have to contemplate that, right? That's part of the implication of joyful effort, right? So you have to, and part of it is like sometimes we have an idea that like we're inherently bad, or inherently unenlightened or inherently selfish, or inherently lazy, or inherently something. And w there's an implication here, because it comes from the perfections, right? Perfection, uh, so the idea here is that you have to recognize, I'm not inherently anything. Whereas everything came about due to causes and conditions. The fundamental Buddhist teaching, or the most fundamental Buddhist teaching actually, is dependent origination. Right? Everything depends upon causes and conditions. So who you are today depends on causes and conditions, right? In other words, you're empty of being intrinsically and inherently and permanently who you think you are today. <laughs> and so, if you cultivate joyful effort, um, you know, there's a saying, Apabankar she says, you know, if you do the practices, um, even if you don't want to become enlightened, you'll become enlightened. Like, uh, <laughs> like in other words, cause, cause, whatever you create the causes and conditions for, that will come about. <coughs> Does that make sense? That's a fundamental Buddhist thing. Because you're not permanently who you seem to be today, who you seem to be today is just a result of previous causes and conditions. And so that's the implication here, right? If you make joyful effort, anything can happen. And like everything can happen, because that's the nature of reality, is it's dependent, right? And if it's dependent, then whatever causes you create will create different effects. And so what they're saying here is, so if you cultivate joyful effort at doing good things, it may seem hard at first, but anything's possible, right? Um, and so, like, you might think, oh, well, like, bodhicitta, like, achieving actual bodhicitta is for some other kind of being than me, like a Tibetan toku or something, right? Yeah. Like, if you have some idea in the back of your... Actually, I had that. Like, I'll just share that. I remember one day, like, actually, this is my own recognition of a kind of... Um, what's the word? Actually, I, I remember one day I was at... Um, actually, we were talking about her earlier. I was at Hip Loman's house like with a group of um, Tibetans and Vietnamese Buddhists. And like, I arrived and like, I've known those people, I've known the group of people for many years, because I, but um, everybody was like really happy that I was there, just like, I like walked in and people were like, hey, oh, great to see you, you know, like that. And, um, and all of a sudden I realized that like, I had some, it was actually a kind of racial discrimination idea that I had in the back of my mind that I wasn't aware of. I was like, suddenly I realized like, like oh, I'm part of this group. Like, I'm as much part of the group as everybody else. And I realized, like, because I was born American, I felt less Buddhist than Asian. Like, I thought, oh, they're Asian, they're more Buddhist than me. And then I was like, I, I didn't even know I was, I didn't even know I had that in me. It was years ago, right? I didn't know I actually even had that. And then I was there, and I was like, 
why do I, I was like, what in the world is that? Like, suddenly I was like, oh, I'm actually, you know, like, like we're all Buddhists together. You know, this is a Buddhist group. We're all together. I was like, why in the world did I think I was less Buddhist than them? Because I, I was like, I didn't even know I thought, thought that until I stopped thinking it. Does that make sense? Um, that was for me like an example of this. Like, uh, somehow I thought like, oh, I'm intrinsically less able to practice Buddhism because I was born in New York or so. It's like, that's ridiculous, right? But I wasn't even aware I thought it until that moment. But the point is, we have these underlying assumptions or obstacles, like, oh, I'm less something. I can't become this. Or, you know, like, like so, like, oh, I couldn't become enlightened because I'm not, you know, a Tibetan monk or something, right? Like, no, that's not what the Buddha said. The Buddha said this, right? <laughs> For one who practices joyful effort does not dismay. There's nothing that can't be attained that can't be accomplished. Does that make sense? So really what it's saying is that, is like, you can achieve anything if you keep practicing. And if, especially if you develop joyful effort, then it becomes... Because you're creating all these causes, those will lead to results eventually, and then that will lead to that. You know, that. So that's what it's saying. Then it also says, also all non-humans like to benefit such a person. Uh, that person will achieve, I'm changing it from he, because it says he, I'm changing it, that person. It applies equally to male and female. Uh, that person will uh, achieve all manners of samadhi, meaning concentration. So this is getting at a important point. Uh, meditative concentrations come about through joyful effort in meditation. Enjoying, enjoying and having enthusiasm for meditation leads to meditative concentration. Such a person passes the days and nights having results uh, and won't decline because of the mass of good qualities. Um, through aims more noble than concerns of humans, such a person will flourish like an Utpala flower. So the image there, right, is that, and this is important, it's not about somebody else, that's why I'm changing, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, or what the thing is, but, right, that you is the point, you will flourish like an Utpala flower. Does that make sense? In other words, you know like when the, it's like you see the stalk going up, right, and then it opens, right, to the sun that that's you, that's what this is saying, right? That if you practice joyful effort, that will happen to you on a spiritual, it's a metaphor, right? Your spirituality will blossom like that. Does that make sense? Um, and he's saying all that will come about because you practice joyful effort, and it will happen naturally. Uh, now it says, uh, also I'll quote, this is, I just thought, Jeff, I, I, put, I wrote this down for you, actually. Uh, I guess it was, who was it, Geshe... The Geshe who gave the commentary at, at who, who used to teach at Institute of Lama Sonkaba? What was his name? Uh, Jampa Gatsu. He, he was talking about the benefits of joyful effort and, and the faults of laziness. So he quoted Lama Yeshe. So, that's what was so he said, Lama Yeshe said, for the lazy, even water can't reach their mouth. And he was saying, like, that you have to lift the glass. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. He was saying, so if you have the glass of water there, if you're lazy, then the water, even the water will never get to your mouth. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. So Geshe Jamagatsu quoted Lama Yeshe saying that. And then he said, as Geshe Jamagatsu said, you have to pick up the glass. <laughs> and so he was saying, um, so if you're lazy, nothing will happen. You can't even drink a glass of water. You have to have some energy uh, and enthusiasm. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so the disadvantage of not undertaking joyful effort. So then he says, um, for the lazy, enlightenment is very far and far in all ways. In the lazy, generosity through wisdom, I mean, the six perfections don't exist. For the lazy, the welfare of others does not exist. Right? Um, and I want to pause there and say something here about laziness. Um, it's an important point. Like, from a Buddhist perspective and from the perspective of joyful effort, lazy can mean what we mean by usually by lazy, right? Like, usually when we say, oh, somebody's lazy, we mean they're like indolent, right? Like, they just sort of they sit around and they don't do anything, right? And that is one version of laziness. But here, in this context, that could be laziness, like just not, you know, being too, like, passive and lazy to not want to, so you don't even do your practice, right? you don't do practice. But here, laziness can also mean being incredibly busy. Like, so in other words, very hardworking people in this context can be very lazy. Because in this context, lazy means not making effort at what's meaningful, right, and what's virtuous. So, like, people who spend humongous numbers of hours, like, um, you know, and whether it's at work, or decorating their house, or shopping, or hanging out with their friends, or, you know, you know people could, like, work, like, so somebody could work, like, um, you know, 60 hours a week, according to this, and be lazy. Because if their, if their job's not virtuous, 
Does that make sense? So if it is virtuous, that's different. But. Does that make sense? So um, in this context, lazy doesn't just mean passively sitting around. There are active versions of laziness, which are spending your energy doing what's not meaningful. So, so when it says, for the lazy, enlightenment is very far away, that could mean the indolent person, or that could mean the busy person who's busy doing the wrong things. <laughs> Um, now, another quote. Uh, the one foundation of the mental afflictions is laziness, no matter in whom. Uh, one who has laziness by itself does not have qualities whatsoever. So two points there. If you're lazy, you won't develop any virtuous qualities. It's saying, right? And then the mental afflictions, because here, again, you have to think, what does laziness mean? Right? You'd say, well, why is laziness the foundation of all the mental afflictions? But you have to remember, what is, again, what is ever joyful effort? The essence of joyful effort, right, is Dharma practice. What's Dharma practice? <laughs> What's Dharma practice? Um, um, so I'm going to pause for a minute, because what's Dharma practice, actually? That, oh. Actually, I'll ask you guys, what is Dharma practice? What does it mean to practice Dharma? Developing the mind. What's that? Developing the mind. Developing the mind. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Practicing the teachings of the Buddha. Practicing the teachings of the Buddha. To get benefits. To get benefits. And uh, I mean, there are various definitions, so none of those are wrong, but they're all correct. But um, I guess what this is getting at, in a way, this quote, I think, is this. is Like, there's a saying, uh, or a teaching that says, um, you know, Actually, it's saying, you know, even the teachings of the Buddha, if they don't decrease your mental afflictions, you're not really practicing Dharma, right? Like, in other words, you have to apply those teachings in a way so that they're decreasing your mental afflictions and increasing positive qualities. Um, otherwise, you won't get happiness, right? In other, words, the only, in other words, the way you get happiness from Dharma practice is by having some degree of success, gradually, in decreasing your own anger, your jealousy, your pride, your craving, and so on, and increasing joyful effort, love, compassion, and so on. And so, here it says, the one foundation of mental afflictions is laziness. So what it means is, we have mental afflictions, right? We, there is, we have them. And then, if you, so if you don't practice joyful effort at overcoming them, it's like, what's the word? A garden full of weeds that you're not weeding. It's just going to get more and more weeds, right? If you have joyful effort, by definition, right, you're practicing Dharma, which means if you're practicing correctly, you should be decreasing those mental afflictions. So you're weeding them out, right? Which means you'll get to happiness. You'll get more peace. You'll get more mental peace. And then that becomes self-reinforcing, as you were pointing out. Like, if there is a, it, that, gives you, that really starts to give you that energy. That's why, like, when you said the yogi or something, actually, really, this quote gets at that. Whereas for the yogi, who's actually successful, where their meditation, they're off in retreat, and what their practice is, is they're decreasing their mental afflictions, they're increasing their positive qualities, then they're getting a kind of joy and then bliss and so on, uh, that's a side effect of that, or a natural effect of that. And so for that kind of person, they don't need any other, they don't need anybody to point out something to them, or give them positive. It's because for them, uh, they're having success in this, actually, in overcoming their own mental afflictions, which is giving them deeper and deeper levels of peace, right, and tranquility, and um, joy, and happiness. And so for that kind of person, uh, they don't need anything else um, to reinforce their joyful effort. So he says, you should think like this. Right? So that you get the point there. Up to that point, we've covered um, thinking about the benefits of, um, of joyful effort and the faults of not having joyful effort. Now he says, um, adverse circumstances for joyful effort. So, and he's pointing out there are two types of, of obstacles to joyful effort that he's going to address next. One is the laziness, laziness of procrastination that thinks... Um, I'll do it later. There's still time, right? So one kind of joyful effort, and one kind of obstacle to joyful effort is procrastination. Does that make sense? Um, and then another type of um, obstacle to joyful effort, I call this one, uh, I think he, well, the translator does too at some point, distraction. Because the first line he says is, um, the person is overcome with their attachment to bad activities. And again, bad activities here includes actual negative things like insulting people or hurting people and so on. But in this context, bad activities also includes meaningless activities. Does that make sense? So 
you could say, for many of us, you could say that's most of what we do is that activity um, in, this, in, in, the, in this definition, right? So do you understand that? There are two different obstacles here being addressed to joyful effort, right? So procrastination and distraction. And so he's going to get at now, because he's teaching how do you cultivate joyful effort. And so he's saying, uh, next he says, so how do you overcome procrastination, in, in, spiritual procrastination? Um, and actually what Lama, uh, what Lama Sokapa here suggests is practicing the uh, contemplations he taught earlier in the section of the small scope. Does that make sense? So if you're, being, if you're spiritually procrastinating, he says, think about, first thing he says is this body that you have obtained quickly disintegrates. So he's saying, meditate on impermanence. Then he says, also meditate on the suffering in the lower realms. After death, you will fall to the lower realms. Third, he says, meditate on precious human rebirth. It will be difficult to obtain this kind of life again. So he's saying, if you're being, if you're spiritually procrastinating, meditate on precious human rebirth, impermanence and death, and the suffering of the lower realms. Um, which were taught earlier, so he says, go back to that section. Uh, Rajiv. Yeah. Yeah. I just wonder, Dr. Lord, why would he put precious life before death and impermanence in order? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I wondered that too, actually. Um, I didn't hear the question. You want to say it again? No. Oh, I was saying, usually, lamens are uh, precious life. Then death and impermanence comes later. So I'm asking why Amazon Kappa has this order. Well, actually, the way he phrases it here, actually, is it will be difficult to find such a support, good support once again, which is which is actually one of the one of the contemplations in Precious Human Rebirth. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure why that order, honestly, because yeah, you ordinarily you would meditate on Precious Human Rebirth first, then impermanence and death, and then the suffering lower realms. Actually, you would do it in that order. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure why in this why right here it's presented in a different order. But I'm not sure. I would still do it in the order presented in the Lam Rim itself, but I'm not sure if that's the translator or if that's how Lama Sokapa presented it. Um, and actually, I'll just share one point like, uh, that I think is directly related to this. Actually, it's another comment from Reaper and Bichet, um that I read. I don't even say it personally, but, uh, but he made a point. He said, up until you realize bodhicitta, he, said, and, and he was getting a joyful effort because he said, like, what was the metaphor he used? It was something like, the rocket fuel or something. It was like giving this idea of like the energy, the source of energy, like the gasoline, the rocket fuel or whatever, that propels your spiritual practice is awareness of impermanence and death. Actually, that's what makes you be practice spirituality. And then he said, once you realize bodhicitta, then um, that becomes the rocket fuel of your spiritual practice. <laughs> um, and you no longer, what's he say, that becomes the main focus is your compassion. But it, and part of the point there is, <laughs> so to say it this way, while we're still self-centered, right, it's, it's awareness of our own impermanence and death, right? Like, oh no, I'm going to die. Like, and, like, I want to live a meaningful life. I don't want to suffer after, you know, I want to have a better rebirth. I want to not, whatever. I want to make some, I want to make some purpose of my life. I want my life to have some meaning. I want my life to be of some benefit. I want my life to help others. Or I want my life to lead to a good rebirth. I want my life to lead me on, to progress on the spiritual path, right? And it's the sphere of impermanence of death, actually, that sort of propels that. Eventually, when the person actually realizes bodhicitta, that gets reversed, right? Their main concern is all sentient beings at that point. It's love and compassion. So for that person, the fe actually, the fear of their own death is no longer such a big deal, but they're, they're, they kind of have a, from morning till night, they have a natural energy that comes from love passion. So he said that. He said, so that's what Lama Tsongkhapa is getting at here. He's assuming if you're, if you're lazy because you're procrastinating, you probably don't have very strong bodhicitta yet. So let's emphasize impermanence and death, basically, because um, <coughs> there's a kind of implication that we're still self-centered. Right? If you were um, already realized bodhicitta and were practicing it well, of course, then you wouldn't procrastinate so much anyway. It reminds me when you have a deadline, you've been procrastinating for a long time, and it's like two hours before it's due, and you get this incredible sense of anxiety. And that anxiety propels you to get everything done you should have done weeks ago in two hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
I maybe it's because I'm not as familiar with the world work as I'd like to be, but I feel like this order of like talking about the disintegration and then the lower realms and then like reflecting on the precious human rebirth. I feel like that like it's like time sensitive, like going off what of, you just said. Yeah, yeah like, it's time sensitive rather than being like, Wow, this is so great like you know, it just it reverses the order of like, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess there is something, if you think about it psychology, you're right, right? Because if you start to think, wow, I'm going to die any minute. Um, yeah, that's the that, logic of disorder, for sure. Yeah. And I may never find this again. That's it, right? So I may die any minute, I may go to lower realms, I may never find this again. But actually, Jeff, do you find that, like, you know, I, mean, I mean, since retirement, and you mentioned, like, feeling like... <laughs> <laughs> that it, it propels your practice. I was just saying that I find laziness the seventh perfection. <laughs> I think that tells you everything you need to know. Sounds like a strategic it. anxiety. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need a certain level of, right, if you're self-centered, you need a certain level of anxiety that's self-centered to make you do something. Um, and then he says, okay, now, next one. So then how do you overcome the distraction that's overly attached to bad or meaningless activities? Um, and basically there, you actually have to, I, I mean, you can read the words, but basically what he's saying is this, is like, um, basically what he's saying is like, you have to understand, actually, you have to look at your, you have to actually have the right perspective on your own life. And so, the perspective of the Dharma on your life is this, just to remind you, right, is like you, and not somebody else, you, have the best life form in the universe for practicing, for spiritual prog progress. You personally do. Does that make sense? You have to think that. Like, I, you have to have, the, that has to be the, found, for this to make sense, you have to have that self-image, right? You have the best life form in the universe for spiritual progress. Almost no creature in the entire universe has <coughs> it, right? Like, think of the entire <coughs> ocean, right? Think of, like, you know, there's, like, oceans and oceans of sentient beings, right? None of them have that, but you do. Um, that's the first point. You have to, like, have this self-image. That's who you are right now. And, like, you can become enlightened, actually. You're capable of that in this kind of human body, this especially unique human body. Like, it's really the best situation anywhere, is what you have. And then, like, if you waste that, right, it's like, that's, unbel that's an unbelievable loss. Like, from a Buddhist perspective, that's the biggest loss you could have. And so, like, you're in this situation where it's like, there are different metaphors they sometimes use for this, but it's like, it's like this. Like, if you imagine, like, um, a person who's been in poverty their entire life, right? And then somebody says, um, like, if somebody puts them in, like, a room full of diamonds and says, you have five minutes, grab as many as you can, right? Like, and then you're going to be kicked out. But however many you, you grab, like, and if the person, like, says... Okay, but first I want to check my email. <laughs> like, you're like, you know, like, <laughs> I know I got four Facebook likes. Wait a second, like, you know, like, right, you'd want to like slap the person, like, yeah. you know, like you'd want to knock the thing out of their hand and say, "Go, freaking get your diamonds!" You know, like you've been in poverty your whole life, your family's in poverty, get your god. Like, that's the perspective that the Buddha has about you. Does that make sense? Like, like um, that's what this is saying. Like, that you have that kind of situation, right? You have this unbelievably precious situation where you're like surrounded by diamonds, right? And you've been in poverty not just for this life, but for countless lifetimes. Like, and everybody who you know and love has been in that poverty. And like, you can grab the diamonds for everybody, right? And it's like, and so this is it. So if you're saying, oh wait, but first I have to like, check my take a selfie. thing. Yeah, take a selfie. <laughs> Whatever. Like, it's like, you know, like the Buddha saying, wake up! Like, come on, you know, this is your opportunity. This is the chance. Like, so you have to think like that. You have to see yourself in that way. Does that make sense? And if you don't see yourself in that way, then you don't realize. Like, you think, oh, who cares? It's just, 
like, you know, oh, it's just today. I didn't get around to it. Like, you know, there was a new episode out of whatever, you know, like I wanted to see the newest one and something. Like, and again, like what it's saying is not like, what it's saying is like you don't recognize your existential situation, which is you have the most precious opportunity in the universe. It's not going to last. You can achieve anything with this. But once you die, it's lost. Right? Um, and, and if you see, start to see yourself in that way, then naturally you'll drift away from distraction towards what's meaningful. Well, I kind of see it as energy levels, too. So, for example, the reason why people don't want to achieve enlightenment, they'd rather do knowing other things, is that because typically your best bang for your buck activities require a lot of work and a lot of energy. And so they find the distracting little ones way more enjoyable to engage in because they're not willing to invest that or they don't have that energy they're to invest in. It. So the, I've thought about it myself and that the way I kind of got around it is that if you raise your overall energy levels, when the time comes to make a decision of what you're going to invest into, you know, when you've got surplus energy, you're more willing to be like, I'm going to do the hard thing rather than the easy thing. Mm -hmm. That's true. And also, and I guess, and, and part of it, so that's true. And also, and you have to really see the benefits of the hard thing, right? Um, to want to invest. Right. Um, you have to really believe and see some, like, wow, there is, the payoff will be huge. Right, because so you have to make a lot of sacrifices. Yeah. So, basically, what you said, uh, my friend, was like, we are inherently lazy. Well, no, not necessarily. <laughs> so basically is that really difficult activities that are going to have a lot of uh, a lot of reward for them inherently are going to require a lot of time and energy. And if a person doesn't really have a lot of energy because they've dissipated it in a million different ways, is that when they're coming to that fork and they're at the crossroads, you know, do I engage in this very difficult activity that's going to be painful, or do I do this other activity that's not going to be painful but won't get any as big a benefit? they're going to be more likely to choose the less painful, easier activity. So one of the ways that you can make it more likely you're going to do the more difficult one is that if you can raise your overall energy levels. And I think, i, I just make one comment. I think that, I mean, I mean, that's probably true for some people. I can think of other, I can think of individuals who are extremely energetic, but give all their energy to right. meaningless things. So, I mean, it, it depends on the person, but I think what you're saying is valid for, for certain kinds of people. Um, then, of course, you know, I can, I'm, I'm just pausing and think, I can think of some people who like, um, whose natural nature is to be incredibly energetic, you know, but they put tons and tons of energy into the wrong things. For you. So and I think it depends, but I think <laughs> what you're saying is correct for a certain kind of person. I, I can try having Red Bull before many <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Sometimes I have tea, so. Um, and then I want to make sure we cover this part too. So another adverse condition to joyful effort, and this is an important one psychologically, I think, for Westerners, maybe for everybody, but for, I think, uh, it's important. Uh, many people I meet have this one, I guess that's my point. So it's the, it's the adverse condition is discouragement that thinks, how could I ever accomplish anything like that? So it's a sense of discouragement, right? And he gives three types of discouragement. One is discouragement regarding the object to be attained, meaning, uh, so you, this is where the person thinks, you know, Buddhahood is wonderful, but come on, the Buddha has so many positive qualities, I could never be like that. Well, that's the one. The second one is regard, not regarding the result, but regarding the practices. And he gives an example. He says, um, well, I've, basically the person says, well, I've read some Buddhist scriptures where these great bodhisattvas give away their arms and legs and head. That's too hard, I can't do it. Uh, so I give up. Right? Um, Sometimes it feels like that would be easier. <laughs> like it would just be easier, like to give away your arms. <laughs> yeah, like doing the other stuff is just like that's just like a, that's a big thing, and I like here's my arm, and good, I've, I'm done with it. <laughs> but the other stuff is like more finite and subtle, and I can't like literally give my arm every day to like you know if I gave my arm to, or like, maybe that's not an arm, it's like, but like if I gave all the food in my house to like this one person outside my house, and then I like took all my money, like that's not like, like that, and then I like chopped up my body, like, and then I like gave it to all the little animals, and like little ants, like in one sense that would be easy, but on the other sense, like then I don't have 
then, I, then like, I don't know what my next rebirth is, and I'm not skilled at that. But if I could, then that would be the easiest thing to do. Oh. <laughs> that would be, like... Oh, it's a copy in the next section. It discourages us from doing it too quickly. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he advises against jumping ahead to that practice. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So yeah, don't try it. Don't try it quite yet. <laughs> uh, he advises. Yeah, he's, he says. Uh, but um, well, part of actually part of the antidote to that though is uh, just to what you're saying. I think is joyful effort, isn't it? Is it or is this finding joy in those other? In the small practices and in the medium sized practice, right? it's like, is learning, is cult that's why we have to cultivate the joy flavor, right? It's, it's like, because it is love, right? Three countless great eons is not, you know, if you think of like what, how long Shakyamuni Buddha took to become enlightened, is long, right? And so nobody's going to do that if they're feeling like, oh, this is hard, right? So it was, part of it is like, again, it's, and this is what Lama Sunan was about to say, it, anyway, is starting small but learning. I don't want to say that actually, like, this is really important. Like, how do you cultivate? Maybe it's like a little aside, but it's related to your question, right? Like, how, is, when you think about how do you cultivate joyful effort, it's actually learned. Like, it's often like. Um, I'll, actually, I'll share an example. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, lately I've been doing the um, what's it called, mandala practice, like mandala offerings, you know. And um, I remember one time Kenshiram she said somebody asked Kenshiram she, well, is it better like to start off by actually giving away big things? You know, or to just imagine, which is what the model offered, right? You're sitting there with a plate and some stuff and you're imagining. And he said, oh, at the beginning, it's much better to imagine. Like, because if you, you know, when you're actually giving away a lot of stuff, then like for beginners, they'll become discouraged, they'll start to grasp, they'll sort of resent it, they'll think, well, why aren't I getting much back? They'll, like all kinds of problems will arise uh, for that person. And then he was saying, but if you start off just by cultivating, because generosity is mainly a state of mind. So he was saying, if you cultivate that state of mind and joy in giving, and finding the joy in giving, like as a mental state, and then naturally the behavior will sort of flow from that. It won't be a source of suffering. It'll be fun. He didn't say fun, but that was my addition. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we would use that word in particular. But, um, and so the point is cultivating a sense of joy. Like, you know, and I remember like, what's there to say? Like, like so I, I, like, I'll just share it. Like, so I was doing the practice of the mandala offerings, right? And then there's like, so you spoke, like there's these long, like there's a list of 37 things you can visualize, right? Like they're taught in the list, you know, you can, and like, I was like, oh wow, like if I were to try to like rigidly remember every single one of them every time I recited this short, it was a very short prayer, like I would get stressed out. And then I was like, I started doing it, I was like, they're like, these are, many of those things are like symbols in Indian mythology or Indian something, right? But like, I was like, well, those are similar like to um, the Philosopher's Stone. And those are similar to, I was like, you know, like, um, I was like thinking of all the different symbols from other cultures. And I was like, well, I can offer all those too. You know, like the beautiful, the most beautiful symbols of every culture. And my point is like, it starts to be fun. I was like, oh, now it's working. Like, does that make sense? And like the same thing, like, like, uh, said that? somebody pointed out, like, you know, like if you just like come home from work and you lay on your couch and you just think about like love, that has infinite benefits. Does that make sense? Like love for all beings or something. And that's fun, actually. You know, like, like that's relaxing. And so the point is, is like, we have to like practice in a way, like, or like if we think like, oh, I just came home from work and I worked really hard and I'm supposed to sit and recite something, like that seems stressful, I think, sometimes. But, um, but if you came home from work and you just think, okay, I'll just lay on the couch and like think about love for all beings, but that's infinitely beneficial, but it's Dharma practice that's fun. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know, I, th I would think that's fun. So the point is like, we have to like cultivate practices that are Fun, I think. Otherwise, we'll get discouraged. This is what he's talking about. Because then you don't want to not. Do, I guess the point being, like, it should be something where you think I'd be happy to do this for three countless great eons. Like that'd be fun. If I got to do that for three countless years, that's great. Like, think about love for all beings. That's great. I wouldn't mind doing that for three countless. Like, or you know, imagine giving everybody everything they need. Like, and then maybe eventually I can actually give it. Like, because. Because that's part of it, right? Like you think, like for me anyway, like when, like when doing the mandala, I'm just giving an example, right? Like you think, well, the, the result of generosity is resources, right? But it, they're connected to generosity. So I'm like, oh, so like, then you could actually do the things. And then you look at someone like Lama Zopram, and you're like, oh, that's how he's able to do it. He cultivated generosity for so many lifetimes. Now he can give 
you know, he goes all over the world, right, creating all these projects or something. But it's because he's done that for lifetimes. So I guess my point is, is like, I think you have to like start with things that are fun. Actually. <laughs> um, so, so like Joe, for like many practice patients, like come abiding. So they have to do with the body, right? Like, because when you do come abiding, come up, when you come down your body, you come down your body. Yeah. To be able to make, I mean, right to practice. So like, like joyful, joyful effort also you can do it with, with the body, right? How would you do it with the body? Like, say what you mean. I mean, like, I mean, like, use the body energy, like, yeah. you find with the body, I mean, yeah. instead of focusing on the mind. Yeah. yeah, it's both, actually. It's both the mind. You can cultivate on the mind, the body first, then the mind. How would you start? Because like with generosity, the like when you do generosity, right? They say like you can give, you just you give anybody like money or whatever. But like they say like, if you give without a motivation, then is then it's not generosity, right? Right. So you have to you have to have that state of mind, or like. So I think you have to start with the mind. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Because the mind has to be there first, right? The right, like the actual feeling of generosity. So you have to feel joy forever to, to the mind. And then the body can do the behavior too. I can do the behavior. So, yeah, so you have to cultivate on the mind. I think the mind has to go first. Yeah. So you have to say the motivation. So it's a motivation you said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like a motivation. Yeah. So I think you have to do the mind first, the motivation. Okay. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, And then, the, oh, the third kind of discourse, right? So the first one was feeling like the result is too hard, right? It's too exalted, I can't ever be that. The second one is thinking the practices are too hard, and so getting discouraged. And the third type is thinking that the process, the, the length of time, is too much, right? So it's like thinking, uh, as you say, um, you know, basically, like, if it's going to take so many lifetimes to be cumulative, that seems so daunting, I, I can't do it, and getting discouraged. So it's, those are the three types of discouragement that Lama Sakapa is pointing out, a, a person who's trying to cultivate joyful effort, that those are obstacles. Does that make sense? So it's like not feeling, what's the word? Yeah, you get the idea. Um, and so then, uh, the f he, now he gets into um, antidotes to those. So the antidote to the first thought, right, he says, is he says, you have to think, um, well, I'll, I'll read it. He says, even the Buddhas did not already attain the elevated paths right from the start. Rather, they were like me and became Buddhas by going th on uh, to increasingly higher paths. Um, since the Bhagavan Buddha also said that even those who are greatly inferior to me to attain, will attain Buddhahood, why should I not attain it too unless I do not make the effort? So again, what he's saying there is, uh, right, is first of all, if you think, oh, Buddhahood is so exalted, I can never attain that, and so on. Um, first of all, important, that's a kind of discouragement, it's a kind of laziness, actually. Is that interesting? Like, in Buddhism, that would be considered a kind of laziness. Isn't that interesting? Like, low self-esteem, right, actually, in that sense would be a form of laziness. Um, and so what it's saying is this, actually a few points on it that he's implying here. One is, you know, the Buddha said insects are going to become Buddhas. They have Buddha nature and will become enlightened. So he's saying like, you know, insects are going to do it, get over yourself. Like, you can do it too. Like, you're a way, you have a way easier time than an insect. You have like a brain that can understand things. You have like, you know, you're able to learn, you're able to read and write, and listen to teachings. You know, ants can't do that. Get over yourself and start practicing. <laughs> You know, because like the Buddhist teaching is that, is that all beings have Buddha nature, right? Uh, and so that includes you, but you have a uniquely positive opportunity that other beings don't have. And then, so that's one point he's making. And the second point he's making is, all the Buddhas in the past started out like you. Does that make sense? They're not any different than you. If you read the life, you know, like the previous lives of his Shakyamuni Buddha or any other Buddha, they all began as an ordinary person. So nobody becomes enlightened except for by starting. And you're the same as them. And if you think, oh, they're so exalted, the point is, well, if you make the joyful effort and you practice gradually by taking joy in the small practices and then building on them, that there's a natural, he says, step by step to increasingly higher paths, right? That there's a natural evolution, like a spiritual evolution that happens for beings. And it's a natural process. And like, let's see what say, right? It's not going to happen overnight. You can't suddenly, you can't suddenly be enlightened. But if you start practicing now, you will evolve in that sense. You'll evolve yourself, and it'll naturally, you'll naturally go to the next level. And then if you keep practicing there, it'll be easier to do this. And then each level gets easier as you approach it. Um, 
actually, there's a teaching I thought that was interesting in the Abhisamaya Alamkara that describes how like bodhisattvas, as they achieve different levels, like bhumis and so on, and the path, that it's like they have different levels of experience of going, oh, wow, I can really become a Buddha. It's like, you know, that we can realize that when we think it intellectually by studying, like, say, Buddha nature, right? And then we have some experience of that. But, like, it, what it says is as you get closer and closer to the goal, it's like you start to be like, oh, wow, like, this is really possible. Oh, wow, I achieved this level. That level is easily possible. You know, you start to have these experiences as you progress. So at each level, there's, like, a different, almost, like, what's the word? level of confidence that comes that the result is sort of within your grasp. And those will come naturally as you progress. So it's like it's a gradual process, and this is getting at your point. It's gradual, you know, we have to kind of like, if we do the thing that's at our current level and do it joyfully and do it well, then uh, the results of that will come, and then some other thing will become possible. Um, so that's a, it's like a natural process, but we have to start. And the key, is, the key is not pushing ourselves, but is being joyful. Does that make sense? Like if we're pushing and pushing and feeling stressed out, that's not the correct way to practice. The correct way to practice these things is, is like, take joy in the present moment in doing whatever <coughs> it is, and then you'll be able to take joy in the next thing. Then the antidote to the second one, uh, right? So the second point was, oh, some of the practices are so hard, like he, but uh, he said they didn't seem hard, but like giving away your body and so on, right? Um, so here he says, and this is what I was saying uh, a long ago, he says, as long as the discrimination arises uh, that that practice will be difficult, don't give it away. <laughs> Um, and then he says, uh, he says, uh, eventually there will come a point when giving away your eyeball or your something, he says, uh, will not be difficult, but will be like giving away cooked vegetables. And he says, that's the time to give it away. Um, and if you actually read in the um, <coughs> Sutra of Golden Light, right, there's a beautiful story there, like about that, where the Shakyamuni Buddha in a previous life is like a prince, and he meets the tigress, this famous story of a tigress with four cubs, or four or five, I can't remember now, uh, who are dying of starvation. And, like, the story is, if you read the story, it's an interesting moment. Like, he kind of, um, he and his brothers all feel compassion for the tiger, and, and then they leave. And then they describe the Buddha's, that, the Bodhisattva at that point, his thought process. And he's like, oh, I'm so excited. I've been looking for an opportunity. Like, you know, he's on the, I think they say, the commentary says he's on the first boomy. Right? So Bodhisattvas on the first boomy are, are like this, giving away their bodies, like giving away a vegetable to them because they control their rebirths at that point. Does that make sense? Because yeah, you were saying correctly, well, how do I know where I'm going to go at that point? But a bodhisattva who's seen emptiness directly and is on the first bhumi, um, they take, only take rebirth through the power of compassionate prayer. Right? So for somebody like them, there's no worry about their next rebirth. And so for that person, he's going, oh, I've been trying to complete the perfection of generosity in order to achieve the second bhumi, but you know, I need to give away my body, but nobody, like, where do you find the chance? And so he was in Nepal, actually, right? And he says, oh, here's my chance. And so he says to his brothers, oh, I have to go back and do something. I'll see you later, you know. And he goes back and he gives away his body. And he's so happy, you know, like that. It's like, like the way you might feel if you had, like, extra food and somebody was like, you know, your neighbor was hungry. Like, if you, like, if you, had, if you made a big thing of something, right, like some dish, and then you found that your neighbor was sick, and you were like, oh, I have extra. This is great. I can give some to them. And you'd feel happy, right? He was like that about that. So he's saying when you're at that level, then give away your body. Before that, don't do it. Uh, because you don't, as you said, because you don't know where you'll go at uh, the time of death, but those bodhisattvas do. That's mm. the point. Uh, it's, it's called Namo Buddha. That's yeah, yeah. Right. That, please. Um, and then uh, the antidote to the third one, right, about the length of time, uh, is he says, the antidote to the third is to stop, is to stop discouragement by thinking, due to the abandonment of negativities, a bodhisattva, uh, so I'll just explain it. What he's really saying is this, is... Um, if you start to think, oh, it's like so hard, it takes you know, so long to become enlightened, what he's saying is this, is if you're practicing the bodhisattva path, let's say this right, you'll be happy. Or is that it's a joyful path. And this is really important, because like, sometimes people think that, like, oh, bodhisattvas stay in samsara for so long, and they're so, they go through all this suffering. And actually, like, that's a misunderstanding of what bodhisattvas do. Like, in other words, um, Bodhisattva's subject, the, the teaching says this, that Bodhisattva's subjective experience is going from, like, is actually achieving greater and greater levels of happiness and peace. Um, and that Bodhisattva's, oh, say this right, like, 
at each level that a bodhisattva is practicing, each higher level that a bodhisattva sort of progresses to, they're more peaceful, more happy, and more joyful. And when it says, oh, they remain in samsara, like, that doesn't mean that they're, like, miserable. In other words, it's like, um, actually, the teachings say this. Like, so, for example, bodhisattvas who have achieved, em who have seen emptiness directly, who are on the boomies, um, let's see, say right. The teachings say, actually, I asked Ken Shurmshay about this. I was trying to find the right way to phrase it. And the, finally, the, the phrase we came up with, like, was, um, in English, was, um, although they're still within samsara, they're not samsaric beings. And what that means, in a sense, is they're still within samsara in the sense that they take rebirth and work for the benefit of others, but they're not samsaric beings because their rebirth is not conditioned by karma and mental afflictions. Their rebirth is conditioned by prayer and compassion uh, for others. So they, don't, they actually don't experience suffering in the same way that ordinary samsaric beings do, is one point. Um, and so, this is, but this even applies to us, is what he's saying here, right? So he, what he's saying is like, um, even for us who are not yet at that level, if we practice the path correctly, you should be happy. I mean, there's like, not, not like you should be happy, like what's wrong with you? I don't mean that. But I mean, it's like, it's a natural side effect. Like you will be happy. Like in other words, if you're practicing correctly, I remember, I think I've told that story before once, but um, like I remember that years and years ago when I was in graduate school and I was, um, I read this quote from Lama Zoparimche that said like, what did he say? When you begin to cherish others from your heart, real, the, the sun of real happiness dawns in your life. And I, th I remember like, I read that, it was like, I was like working full time and going to grad school and I thought, oh. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't feel very happy. I don't know, I'm stressed out today. Like I was like, and, um, and then I was like, oh, I guess I'm not really cherishing others. <laughs> the implication of that is that I'm not doing that. And then I was like, oh, that's sort of disappointing. Because <laughs> um, uh, what Lama Zoparashiva was saying there was, cherishing others just means love, right? Like in other words, that if you're living with your heart full of love, then you're happy. So I'm, that's not like some, I mean, I was talking about like beings who have seen emptiness directly, and that's true of them. But like, what Lama Zobrimshi was saying was the same point. I mean, it's a, a more basic level of this, right? That even at our level, if we start to live each moment with a sense of love and compassion, then you have mental peace. Does that make sense? Like, you have joy. And like... And so it's not... Actually, I, I, I don't know. I'd say I'm with this. Okay, I'm telling you. Something. I was actually thinking this related to myself. It was related to joyful effort because next weekend I'm supposed to go to. If the weather's okay, I'll go up to DNKL to teach there. And at first, I was like my ordinary self-cherishing came up, and I was like, oh, drive to Connecticut. Like it's through. Um, you have to go through like you know Route 95 is the quick, the, the most direct route. Route, and I was like. Winter, Route 95, like going up through the northern New Jersey and then over the bridge in New York. I was like, ah, oh, it doesn't seem very fun, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I was feeling a little discouraged, you know. And then I was like, well, and then I actually stopped and I was doing the joyful effort thing. I was like, well, why am I going? I don't have to go. Like, I can say I'm not coming. You know, I was like, well, I'm going because Dharma. You know, I was like, and because like, it's to share Dharma. And then also it's like, it's Kensar Rinpoche Center. You know, it's like, I was like, how fun. Like, and get to like interact around Dharma, and I was like, oh, well, if there's a traffic jam, that's great. Like, I'm pretty good, joyful effort, right? It's like, that's fine, because you're going for a meaningful purpose. Like, it's not some meaningless trip. You're going for a Dharma purpose. I was like, so if there's traffic, good, there's traffic. If there's like some bad weather, it's not, it's not your life's not in danger, good, that's okay. It's like, you know, and then you start to develop armor like patience, right? You start to go, oh, wow, that's okay. Like, this is all fine. Whatever obstacles arise, good, that's okay. Like, because it's something meaningful. Does that make sense? And so, like, I'm just saying, I'm just giving an example, like, because it takes effort to practice, like, and to shift your mind, but then you can develop that sense of enthusiasm, like, oh, wow, now you can almost feel like, now I hope there is some obstacle. It's good. I hope you're okay or something. That's joyful effort. Does that make sense? Like, so you have to cultivate it, and it takes practice at first. I, mean, I guess eventually bodhisattvas have that naturally. Um, but we can cultivate that by, by seeing things differently. Does that make sense? Good. So it's 1230, so stop. So um, there's just a little more on, uh, actually it's very practical, so next time we'll cover that about joyful effort. Um, there's a couple more th points that are very, very practical for cultivating it, uh, particularly about, about friends and so on. 
And I'll just make another comment. Then what happens after that is that, you know, we're sort of, um, so, you know, a fair amount of text to go, but we're like more than two, way, two thirds of the way through. But then we're going to get into meditative concentration and wisdom. And, um, and so that's like a, Lama Sankapa in this text, um, and it, it's a little different than some other Lam Rim texts in the sense that he goes very deeply into those topics, you know, especially emptiness, like really very like kind of deep exploration of emptiness. And so, um, you know, so we'll finish uh, next time, the perfection of joyful effort, and then we're going to sort of embark on a journey, I think, of like this, so this idea of meditative concentration and wisdom, which are very profound and difficult topics. And so, um, and Lama Sankapa really in this text doesn't shy away from the difficult points related to them, so we'll get to explore that. Can I ask a question? Sure. You want to do it after? after yeah, sure. Okay. Not related to this. Okay. So let's do the um, dedication and then we'll have the question. It's the, pre the supreme jewel bodhicitta, where it has not arisen, may it arise and grow. Where it has arisen, may it not decrease, but increase more and more. In the snowy mountain paradise, you the source of good and happiness, all powerful Chinrezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends.